Hello, this is your host, Wendy. Welcome to Experiments in Poetry, the Lament of Oppenheimer edition, episode 10. So the reason why I chose to release this poem this week is because either shortly after or shortly before I release episode 10, um, there is a new Christopher Nolan movie coming out about the life story or some part of Oppenheimer's life entitled Oppenheimer. So that once again brings, like, it, it just reminded me of my feelings about the life of Dr. Robert Oppenheimer. So here is the story behind the poem, The Lament of Oppenheimer. I don't need to tell you my own personal story about my research projects and everything like that, because we're going to use a much more famous and prominent scientist, um, Oppenheimer, to talk about what I feel like people, scientists especially, but I think people in general, if we can to stop having a failure of imagination. And what I mean by that is Oppenheimer was one of the most brilliant men in the world that ever lived, and he got duped. He got duped bad. One day um, when I was writing all these poems, I was watching, I like to watch documentaries, and I um, watched a documentary on Oppenheimer, and I saw, so at the beginning of the video, you see him, and he is a senior now, and he is reflecting on what had happened in his life, and I will get into that as I read over the poem. But when I, when I saw that clip, I thought, and I'll read the quote just in case you didn't watch it. But, um, yeah. So if you haven't watched it, please go back and watch the poem video for The Lament of Oppenheimer because it has a clip of Oppenheimer giving an interview. And I thought, hmm, there's a kindred spirit. There's a person who understands what I'm going through and has been through it. Robert Oppenheimer was born in New York City, and he could speak six languages. He graduated from Harvard, and he wasn't really sure if he wanted to be a poet or a scientist. Um, he loved both physics and 16th century French poetry, um, and he was a kind of bohemian spirit, uh, and he was very, also very intellectual. Uh, he loved to go to this ranch um, that his family had in New Mexico, and near his ranch um, in New Mexico was where the site for the laboratory that they built to develop the nuclear bomb. And Oppenheimer was the director of the Manhattan Project, which was the top secret project to develop a bomb. Number one, secrets. It began in a whisper, hello, I'm Mr. Jones, and this here is my associate, uh, Mr. Smith. Pseudonyms, pork pie hats, and cigar pipes, these gods of matter appear as Joe and John, a schoolboy's prank. Their faces adorn the text of the learned, where the secrets of nature are distributed to their disciples. So when Oppenheimer was chosen to be the director of the scientific part of the Manhattan Project, um, he chose it to be by his ranch that his family owned in New Mexico. And 
I'm saying it began in a whisper because it was top secret. Um, obviously, they knew that the American government had heard from, you know, military intelligence that they, that the um, Nazi, that Nazi Germany was working on an atomic bomb in research and development. And they heard from Albert Einstein. Um, Albert Einstein wrote a letter to President Roosevelt, you know, saying that, you know, not only was it probably true intelligence, but that it is also theoretically possible to create such a powerful weapon. And But Einstein was um, a pacifist, and um, he completely objected to the war, and he would have no part in the war effort, but he did confirm that uh, this was something that could possibly be developed. So they tapped Oppenheimer um, to do the project. So it was top secret, and I thought it was really funny because um, he kind of like all of his colleagues, because he was working at the University of California, and then he moved to New Mexico to oversee the laboratory where they would develop the the bomb in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And they said he kind of like took on a different demeanor and personality on that he would like smoke a lot of cigars and he wore a pork pie hat, which is what's in here. So this first verse is really just talking about... Um, this whole process of where, you know, Oppenheimer took on this pseudonym of, I, I believe he was probably Mr. Jones and that um, his colleague Lawrence, Dr. Lawrence, was Mr. Smith. And they, so they couldn't tell them anything. They couldn't tell them where they would be working necessarily when they first started the interview process. Of course, if they got the job, they would know where they were being transferred to. But when they were interviewing staff and whatnot, um, and they what their job would entail and anything identifiable to the project. So it was all very mysterious. And um, but it was kind of funny because he's going by the pseudonym and like he yet he's like all these scientists they're studying, you know, in the university, they obviously know who he is, but yet he's like, you know, acting like, no, I'm just Mr. Jones and I, you know, and I say um, it's a schoolboy prank because, you know, anybody who really knows um, physics would would recognize him. But, of course, there were other staff, like support staff, that probably weren't scientists and didn't recognize him. Um, but, um, but I still call it a schoolboy's prank. And, you know, their faces adorn, you know, the textbooks that these um, scientists are using. Um, but there had to be secrets, you know, because... It, they're working on a top secret project and and I say that they're going to learn the secrets of nature and they're going to distribute it to their disciples. So in, in science, it's very much a mentor apprenticeship type of learning. Next verse, he says, follow me where I can't tell you what for to fulfill your duty. For how long? For as long as needed. We walked hand in hand on this Hornada del Muerto and tested the Trinity. I call it we'll walk hand in hand because I just felt like it just took so much trust, right? I mean, you're doing this project. You don't know who it's for, how long it's going to take, what it, exactly you're going to be doing it. But yet you took, you put your trust in this person to leave everything. I mean, it was in a very remote location and you just felt like that it was important and something that you need to do and you dropped everything for it. Leonardo um, del Muerto, which is the site, so the site that they blew up the first um, testing of an atomic bomb um, was called the Trinity site and Oppenheimer named it that and I have gone into the 
spirituality, meaning of the Trinity many times, um, in the number three. Um, and if you are interested, you can go and watch the um, White Noise um, episode one and the technical aspects of episode one if you want to get more into um, the meaning of the Trinity and the number three. I never got to look up why why it was special to Oppenheimer, why he chose that name. But I can't help to think that for all the reasons that I'm talking about um, in the spirituality of the number three is that, you know, he was basically testing the boundaries of God and man by splitting an atom unnaturally. And it's also interesting that the Trinity site's name, um, it that was a name given by Oppenheimer, but the name of the site given by the native peoples that lived there, and I believe it was the... was called by the... Apache, who were native to that region, um, they called that area Hornado del Muerto. Muerto. Sorry, I can't really speak it correctly because it is a Spanish um, name, but it basically translates to the journey of death. So, um, so basically I'm saying we walked hand in hand on this journey of death and then tested the bounds between God and man. That is what that sentence is saying. As he knew that theoretically, um, he could set the atmosphere of the earth on fire and kill everybody anyway. So there was that. And so that's why they walked on this journey of death and tested the Trinity because um, they could have destroyed the world right then and there. So next part of the poem is called Children Playing. In the beginning, it was about survival. At least that's how it was justified. Insecure and eager to prove ourselves, we were like children playing. Screamed a temper tantrum war, flash of anger, white then orange, purple, green. Once forty thousand feet tall, our children ended with a, our childhood ended with a bang. So what I'm getting at in these verses is the naivety of the of Oppenheimer, who was directing the project. You know, he just thought it was his duty. It was what the thing he was that. It was the thing that he can do to support the war effort. And I'm sure that's what the military came at him with. You know, hey, you're too old to fight, but you're a really smart man and you're a patriot and you love your country and you, you, this is how you can help is to develop this weapon and we need to develop it before Nazi Germany develops it. And so I'm... At the testing site, at, I'm describing, we screamed a temper tram roar, flash of anger, white, then orange, purple, green. Once 40,000 feet tall, our childhood ended with a bang. So this is going on to, to describe what an explosion of a nuclear bomb feels like or, or looks like. So when they bomb, when they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima on um, August 6 of 1945, uh, over 100,000 people were killed, 40,000 injured, 20,000 were missing, um, and Nagasaki was three days later on August 9th, 1945 with 80,000 dead that survived the direct blast area. You know, they had severe burns, blindness, and, you know, many of them were ultimately 
casualties, dying of radiation sickness and cancer many years later. We cried as the searing winds carrying the souls of millions whipped and burned us as they passed beyond us. We were just children playing God. So the first reaction was like, oh, thank God it worked and that all the hard work and all the sleepless nights and everything they did to that point finally mattered, that they made a difference. But then there was a transitional thought after they saw the destruction, which was um, it was in use. It wasn't in the middle of the desert blowing up a rock that they quickly came to the realization that what they did was used humans as matter and uh, vaporized them. And so they quickly thought to themselves, oh my God, what have we done? they would have realized that they were duped. That the purpose of developing this weapon wasn't to get it into the hands of the good guys before the bad guys develop it, because the bad guys were already done. Before, uh, the, the bad guys, if they were Germany, were already defeated before they ever even tested the Trinity in the first place. But yet they still went on because they figured, well, you know, it might be developed. You know, somebody might develop it in like five years, so let's just finish it. See, the scientists had it in their mind that the purpose, or I shouldn't say the scientists because not everybody felt the same way. Oppenheimer very specifically had it in his mind that when he developed this bomb, it was going to end war forever wait that only a fool would continue war knowing that such a weapon existed oppenheimer only saw things as a bohemian intellectual he didn't realize that he was getting paid to do his work by people that made their living off of war. And that these people wanted to use that weapon. It was not a deterrent. Is They wanted to show their power and use that power to gain more power and he lived to see, not peace, but what he lived to see was a nuclear arms race across the world. Where basically assured destruction would occur. And even then, he saw the Cold War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, various other proxy wars before he died. So he didn't end war. What he wound up doing was to up the stakes of war, to make war even more destructive. So in the third part, the destroyer of worlds. The destroyer of worlds is... Um, a reference to Vishnu, who is, uh, in Hinduism, is known as the Preserver. Um, and he is also called the Trimurti, which is the triple deity of supreme divinity that includes Brahma and Shiva. So he is the embodiment of all three and he is the supreme being who creates, protects, and transforms the universe. And he is supposed to come at a time of when the earth is troubled to restore balance of good and evil. 
this is an so so the third part I'm calling the destroyer of worlds and it goes like this to remain alive we transformed into death the destroyer of worlds a costume we fashioned from our power science and technology we released the lotus from our hands to hold up the trident with both hands. So I hear people argue over the meaning of the quote. Let's listen to um, the segment of the interview where Oppenheimer gives his quote, gives this quote. The world would not be the same few people laughed, a few people cried, most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says now i am become death the destroyer of worlds i suppose we all thought that one way or another so i often hear you know people talking about what oppenheimer believed see in this quote some people are saying that Oppenheimer was the prince and he was just doing his duty. And um, he was not saying that men were trying to become gods. I think that he understood Hinduism enough and the choice of words that he was using, even the fact that said we all felt that way, um, one way or another means that he himself might have been conflicted. Was he just doing his duty to God and country? Or was he trying to press the boundaries of humanity and become a God? So he chose this quote. It was on his mind and he chose to use a quote where Vishnu becomes Shiva. Sh Shiva role is to destroy the universe in order to create it. So, and this goes with his philosophy because you, the destruction isn't necessarily a bad thing because you, you're you recreating, destruction has to occur. Um, and destruction does not necessarily have to be a physical thing. It's not saying that you have to destroy the world uh, physically, but it destroy illusions and imperfections in the world and paving the way for a beneficial change. Destroy the bad ideas so that beneficial ones can take place. So in his quote, when he's changing and he says, now I've become death, the destroyer of worlds. If you think about his philosophy of why he was doing what he was doing, I would have to say that Oppenheimer was not the prince, that he was being Sheba, he was being the destroyer of worlds. The raw flesh fell from their bones as our souls fell from our hearts. Silence, the people are gone, etched upon the scorched surface of the earth. Only their shadows remain. So this closes out the lament of Oppenheimer. Well, um... And I say, our souls fell from our hearts. And I'm using our. 
not my. Because he is the destroyer of worlds. So he is a deity, but he is the ultimate supreme. You know, he under he is now a they and no longer an I, right? Because he's a god. A god that has many avatars that can go into many forms. And uh, he, the soul fell from the heart. You know, he realized that uh, he caused this. And so then there's a silence, an introspect. The people are gone, etched upon the scorched surface of the earth. Only their shadows remain. So I put up here on the screen some shadows of people that were playing um, radiation caused their shadows to be burned into the surface of the earth and the bomb went off when it didn't need to be used and that put a shadow on him but not only you know Oppenheimer was considered a war hero by the people the savior the one who ended the most horrific war the United States has ever been in however Oppenheimer wanted the technology um, to be shared. And he wanted any further development of more powerful weapons to be halted because he said there is no reason. Again, he had the philosophy that the weapon should never even be used. You know, war should be over. And um, why develop more powerful ones? You could destroy a city with one. But... Um, other people um, wanted to develop even more powerful weapons. So they have developed the hydrogen bomb, which was um, 4,000 times the strength of the atomic bomb. And Oppenheimer was openly opposed to development on all technical um on technical and moral grounds, he said. And he wrote a letter to the government. And what did the government do? Well, they determined that he was a threat to the United States. They followed him night and day, and he eventually brought him to trial for being a threat to the United States in 1954, where they stripped him of all of his security clearances, and they banned him from working on any nuclear weapon projects or committees in the future. So they stripped him of his input, input for how this technology um, should be used. Oppenheimer has a few other quotes that I found very interesting, which he said um, at a speech he gave at MIT, the physicists have known sin, and this is a knowledge they cannot lose. Um, you know, friends and haven't seen him in a while and they were worried about him and they were thanking him for his, for being a war hero and for his services to his nation and God. And they asked that they would be seeing him soon. And Oppenheimer responded that he probably wouldn't and that the, um, that the circumstances are heavy with misgiving and far, far more difficult than they should be, that we power to remake the world as to be as we think it. And again, that makes me believe that when he was giving this quote, um, that he was acting as Shiva or um, in his mind that he is Shiva in that quote and not the prince. And that he took on the responsibility for that. He felt, uh, yeah, he felt responsible. He didn't feel, oh, well, someone else would have done it anyway, so what the hell, might as well have done it. That he, he saw in the big picture. And you would think that a lot of people or a lot of scientists um, would be like Oppenheimer, but actually quite the opposite. Um, you know, they were mad that he was against further development of weapons, and they were mad that he wanted to kind of have the technology be open and known to people um, and not controlled by, like, uh, one country 
um, to lord over all the other countries and um, and was against like the arms race and 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 was pissed that 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 he was saying that they should feel bad for what they did that it was not a good thing um but again he he stood his ground at great cost um and and said that he did not believe that it was indeed moral or at the hill to continue on such projects and for that um i applaud him and i wanted to appreciate um his growth as a person for owning up you know he was shiva he was not he was not just a person doing what he was told he took responsibility for his actions and he did everything that he could to try to inhibit the technology from going further um, and spoke when he could against um, against doing immoral science for immoral reasons. He's one of the first scientists to come along and say, hey, stop thinking about whether or not you can do something and really consider whether or not you should do it. And let's have some ethical boundaries. You know, and World War II was the place where that should happen because there was a lot of experiments on prisoners, you know, giving people diseases on purpose and seeing what's happening to them, uh, testing out gases on people, whatever it is. Um, he was one of the first and most powerful scientists to come forward and say, stop it. Stop it now. Uh, um, I hope you appreciate this history lesson. <laughs> and um, I don't know, I hope the story of bioethics um, or ethical research and Oppenheimer was fascinating for you and not a bore. If you would like to hear more of my poetry and the stories behind them, please click um, the subscribe button. And if you have any poetry yourself or from other authors that you are interested in hearing on this channel, please leave a comment below or you can email me at windy at experimentsinpoetry.com. As always, thank you for listening. Bye-bye.